Hello and welcome to PD in a Pocket. I'm really excited here to have today um, a, a nominated supervisor from an actual family daycare service. I've got Christine Eldridge from Campbelltown Family Daycare in Sydney. How are you? Good, thanks, Lisa. How are you? I'm good. Um, we should just let people know that we're recording this in the middle of lockdown. So yeah. hopefully <laughs> when people actually get to see this, lockdown will be a thing of the past. <laughs> yes, fingers crossed. Yeah. How are your, your educators coping with having to work during lockdown? Are things okay? Yeah, good. I think um, it's now second nature. Um, it's, um, you know, they've done it before and they, they did a great job then and they'll um, continue to do a great job this time. So, yeah, good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk about risk assessments and transport and excursions, etc. So, first of all, do your educators do their own risk assessments for excursions and transport or does it, do you do it for them as the service? So um, when they were first introduced, and um, I guess as different excursions come up, we absolutely have templates that we have put together at the service that we can send out to the educators that have, um, I guess, generic things on them um, that potentially will happen during an excursion or a risk or a hazard that they may need to look out for. Um, so the educators use those as a base. Um, but then they create their own. So um, obviously every educator does things a little bit differently. Some travel um, by car, some by public transport, some are walking. Um, so they need to actually complete that on their own so that it is reflective for what they do in their service um, when they are out and about. Okay. And do you find your educators have problems doing those risk assessments or are they quite, is it by now just something that they're used to and can do yeah, now they're really, really good at it. Um, obviously, you know, sometimes they find that for a different um, venue, something different might come up. So they may have a discussion with either myself or one of our coordinators um, to just unpack that a little bit and see what they would put in. Um, with their risk assessments, they do send them through to me for approval before they um, go on the excursion or show the parents um, as part of our authorization. So um, they do have that backup that if there is something that's in there that potentially um, they haven't unpacked or um, those little graphs where the, um, the matrix <laughs> Um, can be a little bit tricky sometimes. So um, we just have those discussions around that and obviously support them through making sure that that risk assessment is the best um, and has the, mo uh, the most minimisation that they can to prevent something from happening while they're out and about. And Kristen, can I just ask, do you have a lot of educators who English is a second language? Because I can imagine that little graph and all the rest of everything to do with risk assessments would be a lot harder if English wasn't your first language. Yeah, we do have quite a few that English is their second language. Um, we do, we probably have about 85% where English would be um, their second language. We did find with our first lot of risk assessments that the matrix that we used that um, Council's WHS um, helped us put together was actually quite complicated um, and that the educators were having trouble um, deciphering that and working out, you know, what line they had to follow <laughs> um, and what letter. So um, we did um, go back and we did work with WHS and came up with a more simplified version um, for the educators to be able to use so that um, it's, very, it's a very simple, there's only three numbers. Um, you know, if it's three and it's red, you can't go um, and you really need to look at minimising that risk. Um, yep. If it's green and one, then, you know, then everything's fine and you've minimised the risk as much as you can um, to prevent that from happening. So it definitely was um, trial and error at the start. Um, but now with the more simplified matrix, it's definitely um, definitely helped the educators. And have you ever looked at the CEQA department one that, you know, that they're using at the moment? Is it similar to that or have you not looked at theirs? Um, we have. Um, we did originally when it first came out and we did use that as a base um, and then obviously, because we are a council service, um, they also had their um, matrix that they were encouraging us to kind of use. So it was kind of looking at them both and then working out the most simplified version. Yeah. 
where the educators were going to be able to meet the expectation of a seeker in the department, um, as well as, you know, meeting council's expectations around what they needed for their requirements. Sure. Okay. Um, so the department has told us that sometimes educators don't think about the hazards en route to, the, to where the excursion is. How does your service ensure that that happens? Yeah, I... So I guess um, originally it probably wasn't something that we pinpointed either um, when we very first entered risk assessment world for excursions. Um, but definitely um, as information came out from the department, um, with ideas around, you know, what should actually be in a risk assessment. It definitely made us review and have a look at that. Um, I think supporting the educators by having them actually send their risk assessment in first, we're able to actually kind of go through traveling in a car um, so they need to you know think about things like if they have an accident how they're going to minimize that um, getting in and out of the car um, if there was road work so little things like that um, we've kind of now by having it in practice and having those templates available the educators are looking at that um, from all angles so they are now looking at you know, things that potentially could happen on the way. If a child takes their seatbelt off in the car, you know, what are they going to do to um, to minimise that risk or, and what steps are they going to take if that does happen to reduce the risk of harm to the children? And is that something that you've found that the department has raised with you on, you know, during assessment and rating, et cetera? Is that so we have just recently had our assessment and rating um, going back only five weeks ago now. Um, so they did look at our risk assessments and they um, didn't question anything on it and said that it, it met the requirements and that we seem to have everything covered. So they did look at all different types of excursions. Um, when they looked at it, they looked at excur walking excursions, um, school drop off and pick up, um, as well as, you know, coming to our play session. And we've got a few educators that do catch a bus that we provide. So they wanted to see all the information for that. Um, so yeah, they, they seemed to be... I take okay. it you haven't got your <laughs> results back yet. <laughs> yes, yes, we do have our results back. So How'd you go? Well, we got exceeding, so we're very, oh, very congratulations. excited. Yeah, very excited to have received that. So... Um, were you exceeding before or is... Yes, we were able to maintain our exceeding rating. That's brilliant. Okay, yeah, yeah. very excited about that. Yeah, I'm sure you are. <laughs> um, so... Some of your educators uh, do do drop-offs of school and picking them up. Talk to me about that. You know, how do you handle risk assessments for those? Yeah, so any outings or transportation um, for the children require the same risk assessments. Um, so the educators are required when dropping off or picking up um, to and from school. And we also have some educators that are supporting families at the moment by doing dropping off from the home, um, taking them into the service and then dropping them back in the evening. Um, so those risk assessments are handled the same way. They need to look at drop off and pick up. So how are they actually managing dropping the children off? What are they doing with the other children that are in the car? Um, you know, how, how is all of that managed and how are they going to minimise those risks? Um, so it's definitely still has a risk attachment, sorry, a risk assessment attached to it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, and it looks exactly the same. And they would most of those be dealt with as regular, like a, a, as a regular transporting so that you'd only have to do it once a year? Or? Yeah, so what we've done is um, for the child who is being actually transported, they have a transportation authorisation form. Um, that we get them to the families to complete to give permission for that tr actual transport to take place. But for the other children in care, it becomes a regular outing because they're not being left, um, you know, at, a, at the school or at, at their home. Um, it's just a regular outing for them. So that, come, that goes on to their regular um, outing authorisation form. Um, and so that way they've got permission for all of the families. Sure. And I was interested that you said that, um, you know, some educators are dropping from home and picking up from home. What kind of circumstances would that happen in? I didn't realise that was something that, you know, educators were doing 
on so a regular have, basis? Yeah, so we have a few. Um, we've got um, one or two parents at the moment who um, have medical conditions which don't allow them to actually be able to drive um, all the time. Um, so the educators are actually supporting them by picking the children up from their home and then bringing them um, to the service so that they can still have that education and care period of time. They still get to interact with their friends and, um, and engage with the educator and have that, um, have that experience. And then the educator then drops them home. So we have had other instances where parents have, you know, lost their driver's license and things like that, but um, yeah, <laughs> but you know, are still requiring care to continue. Yep. So to be able to facilitate that so that the children um, you know, looking after the children's safety and health and well-being, um, the educators have been more than happy to support that where they can. I think I'll file that piece of information in. Mm, you wouldn't see this in centre-based care, would you? <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. <laughs> um, okay, so you, how do you handle regular excursions? You have a one-off um, for authorisation form and you have a one-off risk assessment? Like, is it like at the beginning of the year you say to all your educators, think about what your regular excursions are or...? Yeah, so we used to do it in February. Um, every February, the educators used to complete their regular outing form as well as their risk assessment. Um, when the new regulations came into place, there was obviously changes that had to be made in October last year. So um, it's now moved to October. So each October, the educators will actually redo all the forms um, and then get the parents to re-sign those and then they last for the next 12 months. Um, if there is a change um, in regards to the venue or a regular outing um, that say they're no longer doing, um, then those forms would then be re-completed and the parents would re-have to sign, but they still need to do them again in October. We keep it as a general rule that regardless of the amount of changes, every October they get redone. Um, and that's just so that we don't miss any. Um, so we don't have some educators that are, you know, in May and then some in November and, and then you lose track of who's actually got them done every time. Done in time, yeah, okay. Yeah. And I, I understand that your service has a checklist that educators follow for excursions. Why did you de develop this checklist? So we just found that as part of our risk assessment, um, we could have all the minimisation, um, you know, identify all the risks and have the minimisation um, and have the matrix and have the, that all in play. But for, you know, those routine things that they need to do for every excursion and make sure that they have their compliance checks done for car restraints and that they've got their first aid kit and all of that stuff, we just felt that if we had a checklist where the educator could actually tick off that, um, that they've done that for the excursion, um, as well as put in any comments, so like around bathrooms and nappy change and sleep time and how they're going to meet that, um, it just gives them a bit more of a black and white quick check. Yep, okay, yep, everything's good for that excursion. You know, none of those risks have changed. Um, I've got everything that I need to and off I go. Um, it, it's, it's kind of like a quick reference for them so that they don't miss things when they leave to go on excursions. Yep, yep. Well, I, can I just ask, I've spoken to some educators sometime that basically their in high, whole, in almost their entire family daycare consisted of excursions, yeah? Like the children would be dropped off to their home and they'd set off to the local community in different ways, et cetera, or maybe sometimes going further than the local community, but the whole day was spent out and about. And I always thought that this was really good and a wonderful way of doing family daycare, a wonderful way of ensuring children were present in their environment. But over the last few years, I've noticed that there's less and less willingness to do excursions, probably because of the amount of, um, you know, of risk assessments that we've got to do. Do you find that your educators are still seeing it as an important part of their practice or less so? Um, look, I think it really depends on the educator and the families that they've got within their service. Um, we definitely do have educators that are out and about, um, you know, four to sometimes even five days a week, um, you know, for part of their program. Um, so whether that be in the morning, um, 
you know, going to a different group or going to a play group or coming to our play session or having a morning tea at a park with another educator. Um, so they are quite active in that sense. Um, and But then we do on the flip side have other educators who um, will only come to our play session as their once a month minimum requirement um, and then not do any other excursions. Now that is twofold. Some of them because they don't drive, um, they don't feel potentially confident to take the children on public transport to get them to places. So they might do a walk around the block or something. Um, but the other thing is that we do have some families that actually request educators that don't go on excursions because they don't want their child to actually leave the service. Um, so I guess it's finding that happy medium. Um, yeah meeting parent needs and um, what they're requiring and what they want for their children, um, as well as, you know, the educators meeting the needs of those families who do want their children to be out and about in the community and very active in, in excursions in that yeah. sense. And as a service, do you, like, is that something you talk about with the educators so that you try and get those reluctant you know, ones, you know, who do have licences but are still reluctant to practice it a bit more and you maybe you know um get some of the others to think about parental you know what parents want like is it something you talk about yeah i guess um definitely through our prospective educator training so when educators are, are signing in with our scheme we do absolutely have those conversations about you know the importance of um engaging within the community and um but also respecting parents' wishes. So at the end of the day, um, if you are someone who wants to go out and be in the community and have those excursions, um, then you need to be really upfront with parents when they're enrolling in your service. Um, you know, this is this is my routine, this is my program, we do go out in the community, you know, how do you feel about that, engaging that. Because potentially if you've got an educator that wants to do that and families already in that service who love that and, you know, that's part of the reason that they're with that service. Um, and then you've got a family that doesn't want to, you know, you need to find that balance. Maybe we need to find another educator for that family who's, you know, who's not going to go out on excursions because you don't want to hinder everybody and you want to meet the needs of both parties. So it's sure. just about that compromise. And educationally, what do you, do you think there's value in excursions? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that the children gain so much out of it. I mean, you know, we've got educators that are going to supported playgroups where children now have access to OTs and speech pathologists. Um, so, you know, it's giving them that extra a lift, especially before they're going to school. Excursions to local parks where you're giving children the opportunity to engage in that risky play in a safe environment um, and really get out in nature, you know, especially for educators who potentially don't have a big backyard. Um, you know, it's giving children more opportunities, but I think it also allows the educators to grow and develop and engage as well. So, you know, if they're going to a park and meeting up with other educators, they're getting that social um, outlet that they need and they're learning from other educators. But, you know, and if they're going to a group where there is, you know, potentially an OT or a specialist there, then they're gaining those skills around activities and things that they can be doing with their children to then take back to the service. So I absolutely think they're beneficial um, and it's something that we do advocate for, especially with play session, even when we do have parents that are very um, worried about their child going on an excursion, you know, we invite them to play session to come and see what it's about, to come to the service and see that, to go on the bus run with the educators and the children so that they can engage and see that it is safe and potentially what their children are going to get out of that. So we absolutely do encourage it and we try and educate the families around that as well. For sure. Okay, last question. Like what is it that your educators most have problems with around risk assessments, around excursions, around transport? You know, what do you as a nominated supervisor scratch your head and go, why can't they get this? <laughs> Um, look, I have to say, I'm extremely proud of all of our educators. They have worked extremely hard, especially those ones that do do a lot of outings to understand the risk assessment itself, the matrix and how to complete that. So I do need to take my hats off to them because they have done a brilliant job. 
at first it was a lot of hard work um, and there was lots of moments where I was like oh my goodness you know how are we ever going to do this are we ever going to get excursions out and rolling again <laughs> um, but yeah I think the hardest thing for them was the matrix and that understanding of you know in the first column you have to put your risks in and then you have to rate what your risk is. So how high that risk is. Then in the next column, it's your actions. How are you going to minimise that? Or how are you going to deplete that from actually that risk even being there? And then regrade it. So, you know, it was, it was um, finding that and, you know, trying to explain that, you know, the first lot of um, numbers and letters that you put in are, uh, against the actual risk. The second lot is once you've minimised it, they need to be different. And obviously once you've minimised it, it needs to be lower. Um, so, you know, with people who don't have that kind of risk background, that's probably something really hard to gauge and to get your head around. Um, so it did take them a little bit of time, but like I said, with support, I think if you're providing your educators with the support and knowledge that you have, um, you know, it helps them to understand. And the more they do it, it's like everything. The more they do it, the easier it becomes and the more second nature it is when they're actually completing the forms. And I think that's true probably of everything that we do, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much for talking to us. And thanks, Campbelltown, for also sharing your checklist for excursions. Um, that, that'll be part of everyone's further reading for this topic. Um, but congratulations on your rating. Are you tempted to go for excellence now that you've got exceeding? Yes, the temptation is there. So maybe watch this space, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see how we go. Okay. Thank you very much. No worries. Thanks, Lisa.